Hello everyone, my name is Imesh Pokharel and I'm the representative at interim of the United Nations Human Rights Office in Seoul. First of all, let me thank the PS Corps for organizing this lecture series as a part of its online model United Nations for Successful Korean Reunification Program. This is an important initiative by the PS Corps to reach out to the younger generation I'm confident that these series of lectures will help provide a better understanding to the youths and students participating in this program, particularly about the human rights issues in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, why youths and students should care about the human rights issues in North Korea, and what role they can play in the peaceful reunification of the two Koreas. I will be speaking about reconsidering human rights in the North Korea, the perspective of the United Nations. I'll try to explain about the DPRK human rights commitments, what is United Nations doing to protect and promote human rights in the DPRK, why should we care about human rights issues in the DPRK, how can youth support human rights movement in the DPRK, why centrality of human rights and public participations is important in the diplomatic engagements with DPRK, primarily during the denuclearization talks and inter-Korean relationship. Let me start by giving you a short introduction to the United Nations Human Rights Office in Seoul. The UN Human Rights Office was established in June 2015 to monitor and document human rights situation in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and to work with the relevant governments, civil society and other actors to promote human rights. The office interviews people from North Korea and receives information about the human rights situations in the DPRK from the variety of sources to monitor and document human rights issues. Monitors the implementation of human rights commitments that the government of the DPRK has made, support accountability initiatives for human rights violations in the DPRK, provides training and capacity building programs to different stakeholders, and supports government, civil society, and other actors to promote and protect human rights in the DPRK, just like this program. What are the DPRK human rights commitment at the international level? I will first provide you a brief introduction on the UN human rights mechanisms before I explain the DPRK human rights commitments. The UN human rights me mechanisms primarily comprises of the UN treaties, which are international legal human rights instruments, each treaty have UN treaty bodies, which monitors on a periodic basis how the governments are implementing their commitment. Treaty body comprises of independent experts, so it is a review by a group of experts. UN Human Rights Council. This is an intergovernmental body in which human rights issues are discussed by representatives of the member states. You might have heard about Universal Periodic Review, which is the review of human rights of a particular country by other member states. The another mechanism is the special procedures, which is basically thematic and country experts appointed by United Nations. These are independent experts who work on certain themes and on particular countries. And then we have OSHR office, which is our office and other UN organizations like the United Nations Development Program, United Nations Children Fund, refugee agencies, etc. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea does engage with the international human rights mechanisms. However, it is very limited. Let us start with the treaty. The DPRK has ratified five core international treaties. It has ratified treaties on civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, rights of the child, elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, and most recently in 2016, the rights of persons with disabilities. What does the ratification of this treaty mean? It means that the DPRK voluntarily commits itself to the international community to abide by the provisions stated in these instruments and to implement them. However, we might wonder if DPRK is self-committed to these wonderful provisions in all these treaties why are we all saying that these are serious human rights violations in the DPRK? The answer is simple. Despite its commitment, the DPRK has not been implementing its human rights commitment. How do we know it is not implementing? One of the UN mechanisms which reviews the implementation of the human rights commitments is the treaty body itself. 
treaty body reviews the member states on a periodic basis on their implementation of the treaty. However, for this to happen, the state party has to submit the implementation report. DPRK has submitted their reports to few mechanisms in the recent past. In 2017, it was reviewed by the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and also by the Committee on the Rights of the Child in the same year. The DPRK submitted its report to the Committee on the Persons with Disabilities in December 2018 and we hope that this committee will review DPRK in the coming sessions. However, DPRK has not been that keen on engaging on civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. It has not submitted its reports to the Human Rights Committee and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee for a long time. The last time it was reviewed by the Human Rights Committee was in 2001 and by the Committee on the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 2003. This means that while it is continuing its engagement with other UN human rights system, specifically on children, women and persons with disability issues, it seems not much interested in engaging on its compliance on civil and political rights and on economic, social and cultural rights. Human Rights Council The DPRK takes part in discussions on international human rights issues at the Human Rights Council. One of the mechanisms it regularly engages with is the Universal Periodic Review process. It was reviewed for the third time in May 2019 and it has agreed to implement a number of recommendations proposed by the Member State. It also takes part in the review of the human rights record of the other countries. You might have seen in the news recently that DPRK expressed its concern over the treatment of refugees in the detention in Australia during the UPR review of Australia. So it also recommends about human rights issues in other countries. Special Procedures DPRK technically has never rejected the mandate of the thematic mandate holders. However, in reality, it has not allowed many special rapporteurs to visit the country for assessment. In 2017, it, however, allowed the special rapporteur on the situation of persons with disabilities to undertake country visit to the DPRK. You might have heard about Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK, Thomas Ohey Cantana. He was appointed to monitor and document all human rights violations in the DPRK. However, DPRK government doesn't engage with its mandate because the DPRK's policies is that it does not recognize any country-specific mandate to document and report human rights violations. Despite the DPRK non-engagement, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights continues to monitor, document and report human rights violations. Beyond country visits, the Special Procedures also sends letters communication on a regular basis and DPRK does replies to such letters, which I would interpret as accepting the communication and the mandate. The special procedure also make public comments on the human rights issues. OSHR offices and other UN agencies. OSHR offices, just like our one year in Seoul and other UN agencies support the DPRK in the implementation of recommendations from UN human rights mechanisms. It also provides technical and other support, including trainings to the DPRK government to implement human rights treaties. DPRK engages with our office in Geneva, not to the sole office. And there are few UN agencies which are based in Pyongyang, supporting government or implementing programs promoting human rights. Why are these human rights mechanisms important in the context of the DPRK? As I have mentioned earlier, while there is a limited engagement, DPRK is still willing to engage with these mechanisms to discuss its human rights concerns. There are Few forums where face-to-face -face discussions on the DPRK human rights happens with the DPRK authorities. These forums also provide DPRK with a proper analysis of the situation and proposes recommendations for change. DPRK has to step up to implement these recommendations. I want to highlight here that real changes in the situation can happen 
if DPRK is willing to be more open and forthcoming. It must take these assessments not as a criticism, but as a genuine review and expert support to bring positive changes and to improve the lives of millions of people in the DPRK. What has the United Nations been doing in the DPRK? Foremost, the United Nations for the past several years has been keeping the DPRK human rights agenda at the center of international human rights discussions. It means that the UN and the international community continues to strive to bring changes in the human rights situation in the DPRK to ensure that the government abides by its commitments to uphold human rights and to ensure that people in the country can fully exercise their rights and can live without fear and with dignity. I will touch upon some of the historical developments with regards to UN human rights engagement in the DPRK. In 2004, the UN Commission on Human Rights decided to establish the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK. This was an important initiative to systematically monitor, document and report DPRK human rights. Since its establishment, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK has been documenting, monitoring and reporting human rights violations. The Special Rapporteur has been an important voice providing an independent picture of the human rights situation in the DPRK and urging both the DPRK and the international community on what can be done to improve the situation. The Special Rapporteur has also been an important avenue for the victims, families, civil society organization and others to engage on DPRK human rights issues. He has also been an important public voice for the people. In 2013, there was an, another important initiative. The Human Rights Council established a Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the DPRK. The Commission of Inquiry undertook an extensive assessment of human rights situation in the DPRK. In its groundbreaking report in 2014, the Commission of Inquiry concluded that there are reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity had been committed and continues to be committed in the DPRK. Given the gravity and scale of the violations in the DPRK, the Commission of Inquiry called for the international community to address the human rights situation in the country, including referring it to the International Criminal Court, establishing similar mechanisms. The COI presented to the world how bad the human rights situation is in the DPRK and on the need for the international community to join hands to pursue accountability for the serious human rights violation and the crimes committed in the DPRK. Following the COI report, the General Assembly has since been discussing DPRK human rights issues and presenting recommendations on an annual basis. The Security Council has also been discussing DPRK human rights issues on a regular basis, although for the past couple of years, that has not been the case. This demonstrates that the UN remains concerned about the human rights issues in the DPRK at its highest level and continues to engage with the DPRK to bring changes. OSHR is also focusing on accountability. The office has legal experts who analyze information from the legal perspective, engages with victims and their families and develops strategies for pursuing accountability for human rights violations in and by the DPRK. It has established an information and evidence repository of the DPRK human rights issues, which will be useful for future accountability processes, including truth-telling and reparations. The office has also published thematic reports, such as on human rights violation in the DPRK, human rights and peace process, uh, separated families and adequate standard of living, which continues to highlight specific human rights concerns. These publications are also an important advocacy materials on DPRK. Engagement with the DPRK and providing support is also a key part of the UN work. OSHR and other UN agencies has been providing support to the government in advancing human rights. OSHR policy therefore remains to monitor and document, publicly advocate on ongoing and past human rights issues and at the same time, encourage engagement with the DPRK to provide technical advice, training, and other support to advance human rights in the country. The engagement is, however, very limited. 
We continuously urge the DPRK to be more open to engage with UN human rights mechanisms, including with our office. The UN as a whole is trying its best to understand human rights concerns of the people, assess them independently, and engage with the DPRK publicly or privately to advocate for changes. To a certain extent, it has also been a go-to place for the people of the DPRK when their human rights are violated. Next, I will touch upon why we should all care about human rights issues in the DPRK. As the Commission of Inquiry in its report has stated, the scope, gravity, and the nature of the human rights violations in the DPRK are so used that it's important that the international community needs to be prepared to address these serious concerns through a concerted efforts. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a milestone document on human rights, sets a common minimum human rights standards for all people and nations. It also recognizes that to protect humanity, international community have the role to play when they witness atrocities, even if it is outside of their borders. I will also have to highlight that DPRK is very, very different than many other countries in the world. The political system is heavily centralized. The government controls almost all institutions and activities of the people. People's fundamental freedoms are severely curtailed. People do not have the right to freedom of expression, movement to travel from one place to another, freedom of religion or freedom of assembly. Any comments against the government activities are not tolerated and are punished with heavy penalties. There is no separation of powers to check the unlimited authority of the government. People are at the mercy of the government authorities with no recourse for justice. The concept of independent organizations such as civil society organization, independent media, judiciary, independent organizations like the National Human Rights Commission, which speaks on behalf of the victims or provides support to the victims, in, just like in many other countries, does not exist in the DPRK. The people of DPRK are systematically denied their rights and in the meantime do not have practically any avenues for justice. The international community therefore has a moral duty to speak up and act for the people of the DPRK. We have seen that the DPRK in most instances outright rejects the comments and assessment by UN, NGOs or other organizations. However, I believe it does understand its implications and take any comments from the international community seriously. Actions by the international community puts pressure on the DPRK to make changes. But the change has been slow and small. There are signs of some improvements in the human rights situation due to continuous advocacy from the international community. For example, we have heard of some nominal improvements in the detention facilities. The DPRK has now at least been publicly committing to make changes on some of the rights of the people, particularly at the UPR. The DPRK is also willing to engage on some human rights issues such as disability rights, children rights. So these are some developments. Documenting human rights violations are also important in the long run to seek options for accountability and other remedy for human rights violations or those who have suffered from actions by the DPRK. The victims and the families need to be heard and their quest for justice and accountability will only be achieved if there is a collaborative efforts from all stakeholders, including UN, CSOs, and international community. Now I will touch upon what do UN human rights think about the ongoing diplomatic engagements in the Korean Peninsula. OSHR and UN position remains that the peaceful resolution of the conflict leads to an opening for the human rights improvement in the DPRK. The UN, OSHR and the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK have repeatedly emphasized the centrality of human rights in the peace process and the need for upholding human rights as conflict prevention and peace building tool. We have publicly mentioned while denuclearization and inter-Korean relations are a priority for member states, it is equally important that there is a parallel discussion on the human rights issues from the beginning and that the voices of people of the DPRK, including women, are included in these processes. In September 2020, 
our office published a report laying the Human Rights Foundation for Peace, supporting an inclusive and human rights-centered peace process in the DPRK. This paper was an attempt from the office to understand the views of the people from the DPRK who are currently living in the Republic of Korea to understand how they see the peace process, including denuclearization, unification, what human rights and rule of law issues are important to them, or how can they contribute to this ongoing peace process. The results were interesting. People did care about the peace process and wanted it to be successful. They wanted to be part of these discussions. On denuclearization, people were not convinced that the full denuclearization of the DPRK was possible. On the reunification, everyone agreed that it was necessary. However, on the feasibility of it happening, they were not very convinced given the political and economic differences. The two countries have a different understanding of the reunification. That is what the people said. They felt that the discussion on the reunification was overshadowed by political interest and that there has not been a genuine dialogue to discuss the practicality of the reunification or the pros and cons or the type of modality if reunification happens. People expected that the government in both the Republic of Korea and the DPRK undertake a genuine discussion on the prospects of reunification. That was the view of the many people from the DPRK whom we talked with. From the UN perspective, genuine public participation in issues that matters the public, such as reunification, is important. Also, OSHR has proposed human rights benchmarks for member states and DPRK to take into consideration during the peace process to address past and ongoing human rights issues. These include issues like detention reforms, engagement with international human rights mechanisms, ensuring fundamental freedoms and rule of law, issues regarding separated families and abductions, ensuring equality and non-discrimination, and also inclusive peace process. Now, I'll talk about what is the role of youth and particularly youths in the Republic of Korea. I personally think it is great to see the youths and students being concerned of the social and human rights issues in the society. I ask you to have a continued interest on the human rights issues in the DPRK. If possible, interact with people from the DPRK. Depending on your skills and now with the internet and social media, use your creativity to advocate for the rights of people in the DPRK. Your government engages with DPRK in one way or other. Advocate with your government to prioritize DPRK human rights issues in their engagement. In the ROK, people from the DPRK sometimes feel discriminated or not fully accepted because of the differences. It is important that they are not discriminated in your engagement with them. Make them feel welcome here. Yeah. I've been asked to give some advice to youths wanting to work in the United Nations. So first of all, the United Nations is a very big organization and any set of practical skills is always sought for in, in the system. I would advise you to develop some practical skill sets in the areas of your work. Volunteering, community work, civic engagement can be useful, especially for the work on human rights. The youths can join the United Nations through different streams. One is United Nations Volunteer Program. The other is the Junior Professional Program, Officers Program, which is basically funded by the host country. And South Korea funds a lot of JPOs to be working in the United Nations. There is also Young Professional Programs, which is like a competitive UN examinations where people of under 32 years of age can join the United Nations. And also there are consultancies and others where youths and students can join the United Nations. We also have internship program. Some UN provides stipends, but some do not, especially the secretariat do not because the member state have not agreed to that. But that is also an opportunity when some universities or few governments support those internship programs also. So there are different ways to engage with the UN. 
and, and there are different areas where the students and youths can engage since it's a very big organization. So thank you very much for listening to the lecture um, and I hope it is useful. Uh, you mentioned that North Korea is very inconsistent in submitting human rights reports to the UN. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if the UN um, pressures or urges North Korea in any way to submit those reports, and if so, what form does that take? On the DPRK submitting its report to the human rights mechanisms, as I said, it, it has submitted its report to the UPR mechanisms on, on a regular basis, and it was reviewed three times. But with the TD bodies, it has not been very regular, specifically with the reporting under the civil and political rights and the reporting under the economic, social, and cultural rights. Normally, the mechanisms, these treaty bodies review the member states when they submit the report. However, if the submission is too late, if they do not submit the report for a long time and do, does not re respond to the request, uh, from the treaty bodies to submit the report, then the treaty bodies send the questions on the implementation of, of these treaties. So in the case of ICCPR or the Human Rights Committee it actually is sending a list of issues that, and asking the DPRK to submit its answers or it submit its response to these list of issues to the to the human rights committee so that so that the human rights committees can have a basis for review if needed so that's one of the way that the un human rights mechanisms can uh, pressure the dprk to submit the report but again at the end of the day it will also it will depend on the member states uh, to cooperate or not there is some discussions going on to whether the if, if the member state have deliberately failed to submit the report for a long time, then should the UN human rights mechanisms like the treaty bodies go ahead and do the review without the member states? That's the discussion there, but I don't think uh, at this stage they are going to go ahead with that review unless the member state agrees to come to that discussion. So, so that's, that would be my answer. Uh, so out of the out of the UN mechanisms that you mentioned, I was wondering if there's one in particular that you think uh, is is especially effective in improving North Korean human rights or, or has the potential to be particularly effective? Uh, very hard question. Um, while the DPRK does engage with, as I said, with the UPR more on, on, a, on a more regular basis, at least it has participated in all three. On the treaty bodies, I think the persons with right of the disabilities, I think they are very trying to be more active on that. We are not yet sure how they will implement the recommendation, particularly from the special rapporteur on the persons with disabilities who visited in 2017. And they did submit the report in 2018 on the, on the rights of the person with disabilities to the committee, but that will be reviewed, um, I'm pretty sure, later this year, next year. So we'll have to see once they are reviewed by the uh, CRPD committee on if their interest on the promoting the rights of the disabilities is genuine or not, it will be based on how they will take the recommendations and how they will implement these recommendations from the treaty bodies and the special rapporteur. So uh, I would think that that area. A right of the person with children it can also be another area where they might be interested. Women's right surprisingly has not been of, of use focus for the DPRK. They have sometimes pushed back on that and I find that surprising in, in a context that they have submitted the reports to the CEDA committee on a more regular basis but when it comes to actual implementation especially issues regarding women's participation or issues regarding violence against women 
or issues regarding stereotypes against women. Uh, there has been a very, very strong pushback, giving a blanket statement that women are treated equally in the constitution and, and, and the laws of DPRK and they are the socialist country, so the women are treated equally. So that, that, that has been a blanket statement for the, from the DPRK. And if you even see now the current government structure, now the recent revamping of the government, they, there is not a single woman in, in, in the cabinet now, completely zero. So that also shows that while they are not much interested on, on the rights of the woman also. So, so that would be my answer. You were talking about the international community having to come together in order to improve the human rights situation in North Korea, as well as the DPRK themselves having to improve. And at the moment, uh, there's a, the issue about defectors not being recognized as refugees within the international community, at least to a certain degree, especially in China. Mm -hmm. So which ways or which mechanism do you employ in order to improve this specific issue within the international community? Many people who, who cross the border uh, primarily to, to China, China recognizes them only as economic migrants, which is, which is partially true also given that many people are in search of the economic opportunities in China uh, because that's uh, because of the hardship in the DPRK. And, and many do come there for economic opportunities and, and do not have intentions to come further to ROK or other countries. That's the reality. What we have been saying, and, and if you see our recent report also, is while people come for economic opportunities, some people come for defecting to other countries like ROK, some are trafficked to China, the, the consequences of, of returning them to DPRK is harsh. Uh, given that many people end up in detention facilities, many people are tortured and ill-treated, and many people have to spend a lot of time in the detentions without even a proper due process. Being engaging with China, uh, particularly, is not to send back the uh, DPRK people to DPRK if they are arrested in China. So that has been a continuous um, uh, engagement with the China on a regular basis. China does have its positions. I think I think it has remained um, at that situation. So we have now recently discussed on the if there is options for humanitarian considerations of some of the vulnerable populations within these groups. No, I, I don't want to say it very publicly, but we hope that there would be some positive outcome on that front at least. Uh, but we will continue to work with China on this, on these issues, including other countries. This is a constant advocacy with the member states regarding the situation of the uh, DPRK SKPs or people in China um, who are at the risks of the repatriation or risks of human rights violation if repatriated so so that's that's the my reply right now we are concerned about the digital rights issues of north korea so how is the un actively engaging with the issue of digital rights as in the context of human rights okay. in the dprk okay um, the digital rights issues, I think, I, I think is, um, is interesting in, in a sense that um, uh, the freedom of expression, again, is, is one of the issues uh, that, that is highly centralized and, and very much controlled. And, 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 and we know that people are not allowed to watch foreign movies and, 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 and foreign songs or, or even broadcast from outside of the country. But nevertheless, uh, the internet, uh, not internet penetration, the mobile penetration is pretty big there now. It will be interesting to see how DPRK would balance that given that with many people and working in China and also having businesses or at least um, looking for economic opportunities in China and going back and forth, 
information will flow. I, I understand that there has been a recent change in the some of the laws related to communications and as well as on right information as well as on on the on the mobile actually and also the recent congress also has said that there has to be a the the mobile communications has to be strengthened i don't know what that means exactly it means more strengthening of the government's role which which would mean that the and there could be further restrictions, but it's it's again it, it it will take some some years to understand how that dynamics plays because inevitably even if you control everything with the with the emerging small markets uh, and 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 some engagement with China that that there will be information flow uh, definitely but but again at this point we'll have to see how that how that how these new laws and, 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 and what would be the DPRK response to, to some of the developments that is happening there in terms of uh, communications, digital, uh, digital media and, and others. So, so that's, that's in a nutshell what I can say at this point. Do you have anything you want to say? No, I think, I hope it is useful and, and, and people will have continue have uh, some interest in the human rights issues in the DPRK and, and human rights as, as, as a whole, you know. Um, I always say to everyone, uh, we are not very, very dynamic in social media, but we do have social media accounts uh, in Twitter as well as Facebook which uh, and, and, and our, our website. So do visit them and we do have a lot of reports uh, which we which we publish on an annual basis both periodic reports um, as well as thematic reports so do read them if you have any comments uh, let us know you can write to us we do check our office emails or you can write to any of the staff here um, so and, and do engage with us whenever you feel that you want to know more about the DPRK human rights issues. Thank you very much.